should get her straightened out. Oh yeah. Bring her down, dude. Uh, all right. Oh yeah. <laughs> Just like we planned it. <laughs> Perfect. So I guess we have to determine our best our book match, I guess. Yeah, our top and our bottom, right? Oh, I can't wait to unwrap this. Some spalting in that sapo too. That is pretty sweet. It's awesome. All right, so we just spent some time here, kind of organizing these slabs, figuring out how we want to lay them out. Ultimately, we decided that we were going to put the live edge out. Uh, there was some talk of straight lining the edges, but I think we made the right decision. And you're going to find out when you see this finished product how awesome the live edges on this table look. Real quick, I want to say I'm doing voiceovers from the Argosy. Might be a little echoey in here. I might hear some birds chirping, so I just want to apologize in advance for maybe not the best audio. First step here is for uh, Robert to cut these to length. So the table's 10 foot. We've got 12 foot slabs, which is a little bit of a shame, but we're going to use this drop off for a bench that goes with this table. Got a little kickback there, a little bindage. Um, these probably have some tension in them. They are big slabs. So the way to get around that is to set half your depth of cut, cut halfway through the material, and then come back and cut the full pass. I want to mention that these came from Birdall Sawmill. Some really awesome slabs. I mean, this is some of the nicest pecan I've seen. It's got curly figure to it. Really unique, super interesting stuff. Can't wait for you guys to see it finished. And I wanted to give a shout out to Berdal because they provide a really good product. This video is mostly gonna focus on the um, top, on gluing this tabletop up. So we're gonna start right here on the joiner. Now Robert's already straight lined the edge off that we wanna glue. Did that with the track saw. We've also pre-filled these, so we spent probably two to three days pouring epoxy in cracks and voids and getting it all epoxied up. And that's the only epoxy work we'll do on this. I didn't really show that because, you know, epoxy is not that exciting. So we can use the joiner to get a really good straight line. It's got a 100, 100 inch bed, so it's going to give us a pretty straight edge. Now, it is going to probably not get perfect 90 because it's such a tall piece. It's hard to keep it on that fence and keep it in the position to cut a 90 degree a joint off the face of that board. I will say though these boards come surface from the mill and uh, it's a huge advantage and huge help to us because it saves us a ton of work not having to flatten and surface these. Also have to add that it was a pretty good idea for Oliver to put a foot stop in this joiner. I just love that feature. Pretty dang cool. So before we move forward with the edge joining, we're going to go ahead and run these through the wide belt with an 80 grit sandpaper. Just clean off any excess epoxy that's sitting proud and get them nice and smooth and flatten back out. We had one good face that we used on the joiner, um, but we want to get the other face cleaned up. And once we get these cleaned up, we're going to move to edge joining them um, with the hand plane. So that's how I've done most of my edge joining for a long time was with hand planes. And um, in this particular situation, it's just an easy way to tackle this job because off the joiner, we're not quite as, as, as good as we need to be. We're also going to face some challenges on how we're going to glue this up since it's a live edge. You can't really get clamps on the edges. Um, they're really, this is really soft sap wood, so it would just dent and damage those edges. Some curly, curly pecan, book matched, spalted sapwood. You got everything you could possibly want in this. <laughs> slab. You got a little bit. A ton. It's pretty heavy. It's not terrible. It's not terrible, yeah. So you said a router? I was thinking about using a router to straight line it, but I don't know if I have a 10 foot straight edge that is accurate enough. We'll try with the hand plane. Cool. 
it's going to be it's going to be a challenge, but tear out doesn't really matter. So. So like I said, I used to glue up all my tabletops like this, and I really do feel like the best way to master, not master, but um, begin to better use your hand planes is to edge joint. You learn a lot about your plane this way. Um, there's a lot you can do. You can tweak the, the angle of the joint. You can change, you know, you can take certain passes in certain spaces to change how the joint fits. So it's very useful, and it's actually pretty quick once you get the hang of it. Although this pecan was... Um, it's not friendly to playing. It's hard stuff. Get it just out. Oh, this is gonna be sweet. <laughs> Does it feel sharp enough? It feels good, man. Yes. Good job. <laughs> I tried to do less than I normally do. By I, like, I, I think sometimes I hang out too long and then start to maybe rock it too yeah. much, you know? This is number eight. Yep. It's actually a little bit easier because it's got more mass to it. it looks like it's going pretty good. Word. It's difficult to push because it's curly pecan. <laughs> Just pecan by itself is tough. That looks pretty good. You gotta remember when you loosen it, it falls. tackle this one. All right. Nice. So what do you think? Let's, um, it? Yeah, this, we need to spin it and do a little work on this. Okay. Let me see this real quick and see how yeah, this yeah. is Please. cutting. It definitely feels different than that end. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta like, give it the Get a running start. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, if you're not too worried about tear out, yeah, exactly, you can get away with that. I mean, if it's going to tear out, it's not going to cause a. So this has gotten off. off. It's not off that much. So I'm just going to try to work that square, and then we can. One thing that helps too is if you skew it. Yeah. I just forget about that. Good. So once we get that joint dialed in, we have to tackle the clamping situation. So Robert came up with this idea, and I think he actually saw it maybe on Instagram, I can't remember, but he's taking CA glue and gluing these blocks down, they're eight quarter poplar, um, and then we're gonna use those as clamping calls uh, with the hand clamps. Now, the downside to this and the challenge with this is all your clamping pressure is on one side. Real quick too, we have dominoes in this. It's really important that you get some kind of domino or biscuits in these to help level the joint. It's not gonna add any strength, but it's gonna help keep the joint level and make your glue up go way better. So we start getting these clamps on and, and all the pressures on one side of the table, it's gonna naturally wanna make it bow. And you're gonna see right here as I put the straight edge on it that um, it's got a pretty significant bow in it. So we need to get some pressure underneath from clamps as well to kind of equalize it and um, kind of take that bow out of the tabletop. Okay, well, the gap looks nice. Gap looks I mean, good. The lactose gap looks nice. And so we just have to. A little bit bow there. We just need more under yeah. clamping pressure. 
And so that's what we're doing here. We're, we're giving another test run with the clamps below. It. Still not quite there, so I took it out and kind of gauged the, the edge, and it was just slightly off. So we were able to use the hand plane to just kind of back cut that um, edge a little bit and help it kind of flatten out that top. Like that spot. That's the spot. <laughs> we can put more stuff in your way. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Keep more obstacles. <laughs> Would that help? I'm just gonna sharpen it real quick. <laughs> Doesn't want to cut too much in there. Oh, no, that's where the grain starts running out. Dude. So while we glue this up, I want to take a quick moment to thank my friends over at Simply Safe, amazing supporters of this channel. They are sponsoring this video. Now, US News, PC Magazine, and Popular Science have all ranked Simply Safe as the best home security system for 2021, and US News just named Simply Safe the best security system for 2022. And that is why I have a system both in my house and in my shop. Basically, you get this really cool home base system that connects Everything to a keypad. On. And every home. component you add to the system goes through this keypad and connects to the home base. So you can get motion sensors, you can get entry sensors, you can get glass break sensors, smoke and carbon monoxide sensors, HD cameras. It covers everything you could possibly need to secure your home. But in my experience, it doesn't only secure my home, it also helps in my shop. Now that I'm running the CNC a lot, I have an HD camera from, from Simply Safe hooked up on the CNC, and I can access that camera and watch the CNC while I'm not in the shop from my Simply Safe app. So I found it useful not only in the fact that it secures all of my belongings and tools, but it also allows me to, to monitor my equipment while I'm not there. Even better, I have a my favorite part of the Simply Safe system is the doorbell camera on the front of my house. So I'm able to see anyone who comes to my house, I'll get a notification on my phone shows that the camera detected movement. I can swipe in, look at what it was. I can see if someone's dropping off a package, if someone's at the door, he shouldn't be there. That is a very awesome feature that makes me feel like my home is more secure and my family's more secure. I'm very thankful to Simply Safe because they are offering my viewers 20% off a Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and you'll get your first month free. Just visit simplysafe.com forward slash Andy Rawls to learn more. Not only is that 20% offer to you guys pretty awesome, but there's never a long-term contract. You can even try it for 60 day risk-free to see if you like it. And if you don't, send it back for your charge. There's nothing to lose. Okay, back with you guys. Always thankful to uh, my sponsors for helping support all the work that goes in to making this channel happen. We're gonna shift gears now to the joinery. Now I'm not covering in detail this joinery, but basically you've got, the this is a trestle table. So you've got two uprights, um, and that's what I'm working on right now. I'm cutting tenons in one of those uprights and it has a double tenon on it. So these are about an inch, oh, I don't know. These are probably two inches long, um, half inch tenons. And you've got two in each one. That's why we call it a double, obviously. And so in all, you'll end up having eight mortise and tenon joints just holding together the, the foot, the table support, and the two uprights. So there's a lot of glue surface in this joinery and it's just super solid. This is the Lila FMT mortising jig that I use for a lot of my joinery, and it is solid, man. It'll take these, um, it'll cut these tendons in one pass just like this, and you can dial in the fit just right. It also cuts the mortises. I've used this little jig for a long time, and it's coming. It's it's been pretty handy. It has given me some issues along the way, um, but for the most part, it's working pretty good. Also, I got a new Makita plunge router. It's amazing. I love the new router. It has a soft stop on it that's just uh, like a brake that just shuts it off when you turn it off, which is a really cool feature. I'm, Robert and I are both really enjoying it. Here you can see Robert set up a jig. While I'm working on this joinery, he is cutting out tapers on the feet and supports. And you can see the mortises here. That's where those tenons are going to go. Um, he's going to cut them out on the bandsaw and then just do one single pass on the joiner to clean up those bandsaw marks and then off to the sander to sand uh, with the orbital. Now, I've switched gears here to um, the mortises. There's three mortises, through mortises in each one of these uprights, and these are kind of a cool detail of the table where the stretchers, the tenon of the stretchers will come through and be exposed, and you'll have a, a nice detail, and it's just 
that exposed joinery that really kind of shows the handcrafted touch of this table. The This Lee FMT mortising jig can do the through mortises no problem. You just cut in on one side, reference a stop, and then flip it over and do the other side. Just make sure that when you flip it, you're putting the same face against the jig. Uh, if you switch them and you're a little bit off center, you'll get in trouble there and they won't line up. I do have the old Oliver Mortiser. It has been down for a while. I'm working on getting parts right now. Hopefully we can get it back up and running. So that's one of the reasons why we're using this setup. Okay, so the one downside to the FMT is obviously you have rounded mortises. I really prefer square mortises. I like the look of it a lot better. Um, you got to go back with a chisel and square these up. So Robert and I just tackle this together. Um, and just I've got a cool corner chisel here that I, my dad actually got this. It's from Lee Nilsson. And man, it, it works really, really well uh, at cornering up mortises and taking off that rounded edge. The mortising one was really nice. Yeah. Until I like kind of chipped up the end of it. That's it. Yeah. Super happy with it. Okay, I want to jump in real quick and talk about this glue up. First off, first time I've ever done this in any uh, furniture piece is I fully finished all the parts before we assembled them. Well, we sealed them with a sealer and then put two coats of conversion varnish on them. That's why you see the blue tape on all the joinery. Obviously, we don't want uh, glue on our joinery, on our tenons and mortises, because then the glue won't grab. The great thing about doing it this way is, for one, you get, uh, you know, everything's done once you assemble the table. It's just a little bit of cleanup. Two, you don't have to worry about the process of cleaning out glue squeeze out, which can, if you've ever built furniture, can take a lot of time. So you can see here that the uprights are already assembled. These are actually really uh, my favorite part of this whole design. And they, there's there's one, two, three, four, there's four parts here with eight joints uh, total. So it's a really strong, strong, strong structure. Um, you've got double Morrison tenons on each one of those uprights. Those come together with the two stretchers with the three mortises. Also a great cool detail on this. So you have two matching side-by-side -side three mortises. So once we get those stretchers in, we work with clamps and, and a, a tape measure to get them coplanar so they're not tweaked or anything like that. And then once they're set in the right spot, I come back with some walnut wedges and hammer those in. And then once all the glue is dry, we can pop the clamps off and come back and clean. I saw those wedges off with a handsaw, take a block plane, do a little cleanup work on them. Uh, chamfer the edges. I like to put a nice little chamfer all the way around. And when I do that, I'll tape it off with blue tape just to prevent burnishing the wood by hitting it. And also, I like to come back and kind of polish it um, with like a Scotch Brite pad. And you know, I don't want to hit the finish and, and mar that or mark that and take the sheen off. So the blue tape's there just to protect the finished part. Once we have all that done, the table base is done and ready. Let's rewind backwards now to the tabletop, which we've worked quite a bit on, and get it through the sander and get it prepped for finish. Okay, so we shift gears back to the tabletop. Um, we're gonna knock these blocks off. This was kind of uh, one of those situations where we weren't super certain how well these were gonna come off, but surprisingly, they just popped off with a hammer and they didn't take any of the pecan with them. Um, they just kind of broke free without busting up any fibers. It did leave some some of the poplar on the pecan, but we're about to run this top through the wide belt and take care of any anything that's you know stuck on that tabletop. This was tricky here because this was a 40 right around a 43 inch wide tabletop and this is a 43 inch wide wide belt so we had very minimum clearance to get it in there and, and hit the actual abrasive all the way across. It also was really hard you know the sander wasn't really liking it. It's hardwood and it's the full width of the sander, so we had to go really slow. This took a while to sand. We were at 80 grit. We went through the 80 grit on both sides, through 120 on both sides, and then 150 on one side, on the good side. Uh, and it, you know, it just takes a lot of steps, but it saves you a lot of time um, in leveling it and sanding it. Although, even though it comes out of the wide belt, we do take the orbital and spend quite a bit of time as well sanding with the orbital.
I want to share with you the finish process on this table. So the tabletop was actually somewhat challenging to finish um, because the we left the live edge and that sapwood had what, what we call spalting on it. So it's kind of this process of decay that the tree goes through um, once it's dead and it happens in pecan in the in the sapwood. And it actually leaves really cool colors, figure and grain in the sap. But it also softens the wood and it almost gets to the point where it becomes too soft and you can just flake the wood out. There were some areas where it was really soft and so we don't want to put a hard conversion varnish finish over really soft wood. Um, plus the it's just hard to finish it, right? It's hard to get that that finish to set on top. It wants to soak in. So we have to somehow harden that wood and I went, I've never actually figured out a process for this and I went through a lot of testing um, using CA glue. I actually asked on Instagram how people do this. Most people said CA glue, which it would take a whole lot of CA glue to fill all those live edges. That's 10 feet on each side. Plus everything I use, a lot of people use penetrating epoxy too, which is what I ended up using. But if you just put penetrating epoxy on the raw sapwood, it gets really dark. It turns it like a gray almost and just muddles all the cool color in it and takes out that light colored sap. So I, I just did not like the way that works. So what I ended up doing is putting, I sprayed an entire seal coat of D-Wax shellac um, over the top, the whole top. And then I came back and put two more coats just focused in on the sapwood of that shellac. So I sealed it off the best I could. Um, this will help it'll help the the epoxy not penetrate quite as much um, but still allows that epoxy to get in and harden so once that seal coat was dry it sanded it back I brushed on the penetrating epoxy just on the soft sap wood and along the bark edge and once that penetrating epoxy cures it's rock hard all along there now it did soak in pretty good still even though I sealed it and you know darkened it a little bit but it wasn't near as bad as if you just went right on the raw wood once that finished epoxy totally cured we came back with the orbital with 220 and gave it a good sanding kind of leveled everything off there was a few high spots of epoxy so then I shot my first coat of conversion varnish just laid it on uh, and then I shot another coat and then came back and sanded with the orbital again with 320 and just leveled that finish out a little bit and I, I was able to see as I got into that second coat that the sheen and everything was looking good on the sapwood there wasn't areas where it was soaking in it was a nice even sheen across the whole top. So once we got into the third coat, I let Robert jump in and spray. I've been trying to teach him some of the process of spray finishes. And I'll be honest, even though I'm teaching him, I'm still learning a lot. And on this particular table, uh, you know, I faced a lot of challenges with air bubbles in the conversion varnish. I've never shot conversion varnish and I've never worried about film thickness. So film thickness, or I should say wet film thickness is the amount of finish that sits on the tabletop. And I had way too wet of a film thickness and it was causing bubbles to get trapped in, this, in, the, in the finish. I think I was shooting at six to seven mil. That's way too heavy. This, this particular product calls for about two to, three millimeter, two to three mil thickness, wet thickness. So once I dialed in my gun to lay down a nice good pattern, I kind of practiced and figured out the speed of my movement, how much fluid I needed coming out. Um, I really learned a lot in that and the finish was just coming out beautiful after that. Nice, even sheen, super smooth finish. Um, so it was fun. I got a chance to learn a little bit more about finishing and um, we laid down a really nice last coat. I actually did the last coat at night with a light so I could see my wet where the wet wetness was. I didn't get a shot of that unfortunately, but the last coat laid down beautifully and uh, yeah, that's a lot of talking about the finish, but I wanted to share it with you guys because, um, you know, it's a cool experience for me. I learned a little bit about spraying conversion varnish. This is a new finish that I'm working on and, and using, and uh, so far it's working really nice. Okay, so to end this project, we took it to a really cool property here in Bernie. This is an old, old gas station that, that my wife's uncle actually has completely restored, and um, there's going to be a really cool bakery at this place, but it it hasn't opened yet and it's still in the process of being um, refurbished and so it, it was empty and it had this really cool industrial vibe so we took the table and the bench over there and had a really cool uh, photo session I took some awesome photos of it I didn't show any of the bench in this and the bench is just as amazing as the top and I haven't decided if I'm gonna do a separate build video on the bench if you guys want to see that 
uh, let me know because I can make that happen if you're interested in seeing how I made this bench. I'm going to leave you guys with some of the shots that we took so you can see what it looks like. I just want to thank you for tuning in. I want to say in a world on YouTube full of live edge, um, some of it's good, some of it's garbage. I just hope that I did it justice. Um, you know, I, I can take credit for the craftsmanship of the base to the best of my ability. And I think we did an amazing job of displaying uh, God's handiwork. God is the master craftsman. And that tree and those slabs are something I can't take credit for. It's beautiful timber, beautiful lumber. And I'm thankful for the opportunity uh, to get to work with it, to get to... Um, to get to create a piece of furniture out of something that is far more perfect than I could ever make. So that's where I want to leave it. Um, I thank you guys for tuning in. Let's check out some photos and um, let me know what you think about a uh, build video on the bench. <laughs>